So two weeks ago, I was on a field trip with my youngest son and his pre-K-4 class, not too far from here, in fact, and we spent the day at the Creation Discovery Museum. Now, unbeknownst to me, his teacher, and she has a real bubbly personality, his teacher had taught the class that when she said, ooh, they would respond with, ah. <laughs> so we're going through the whole thing, and every time, without fail, she saw something interesting or impressive and said, ooh, the class would immediately respond with, ah. It was actually pretty funny to witness. You guys want to try it with me? If I say ooh, you say ah? <laughs> <laughs> next time, next time though, okay? I'm sharing this with you because our text for this morning, Revelation 1, 9 through 18, should leave us with the oohs and the ahs. But I'm afraid that too often it doesn't. Why? Well, there are several reasons, but I'll give you one. And it's that we forget that Scripture is literature. And along with literature comes corresponding genre. Now, what's interesting about Revelation is that it employs three different types. Letter, prophecy, and apocalypse. Now, it's the latter that discourages us from drinking deeply from Revelation's pages. You see, Scripture has an uncanny, abil uncanny ability to jolt you out of the familiarity and comfort you find in it. Right? And so you're reading Scripture, you're there pouring over a text, and you're really wrestling with it, reading it over and over again, and finally you manage to grasp it. Finally, you get your arms around it, and then you read something like Revelation. And you're surprised at first, okay, because it seems pretty easy to understand. So you, you, you start off with Revelation 1, and you're like, okay, I'm going to dive right into it. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his, to his servants the things that must soon take place. Got it. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Amen, brother. I'm going to keep on reading. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So you're stepping back, you're like, wow, this is amazing. This, this, this text is actually calling a blessing on me if I continue to read it. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to continue reading Revelation. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. Got it. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before, before the throne. Wait, what? Seven spirits? So right when you think you get it, right when you think you've gotten familiar with the text, right when you, you read Revelation and all those feelings of triumph and all the feelings of figuring it out, all of them are just flattened. And I believe that Scripture flattens our feelings best with apocalyptic literature. Now listen, I get it, okay? I really do. Parts of Daniel are strange. Pretty much all of Ezekiel is strange. <laughs> and Revelation is strange. I mean, think about it for a second. There's odd angelic beings. There's, there's, there's dragons. There's beasts. There's women. <laughs> <laughs> but what you need to know <laughs> about apocalyptic literature is that it's not just about seeing, but about seeing through. It's not about prediction. It's about unveiling, unveiling the realities around us for what they really are. And what John is doing in our text is unveiling not something, but someone. Revelation is the unveiling of Easter Jesus by Easter Jesus to his servant John. And that's the title for my message this morning, Unveiling Easter Jesus. Now, if you can recall our text, remember that John is in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And like anyone describing a vision or a dream, we must keep in mind that he is not seeking to describe something literal, but something figurative. So John is asking us to imagine. Why? Because John is not appealing to our logic. He's appealing to our imagination. 
So he's asking you for one moment to imagine, to imagine what life would look like if the curtain between heaven and earth were pulled back, revealing the resurrected Son of God, the Easter Jesus who cannot be contained by mere mortal thought. And frankly, the vision would be absolutely mind-blowing. But we miss out on that experience too often because too often our Jesus is too small. You see, what we do, our tendency is that we cut him down to our size so we can control him, but we can't, and this text proves it. And so my goal for us is to become acquainted with Easter Jesus in a different way than we might be presently. And in order to accomplish that, I will briefly explain what his figurative description means and what that description means for us. Now, we've established that Revelation is an unveiling. Revelation is a number of visions to show us how things really are, not how they look to the physical eye. And we know this because John's language is approximate. He can't pinpoint exactly what Easter Jesus looks like, so what does he do? He employs simile. And for you English school smarties, you guys remember what simile is, right? Simile is an express comparison using like or as. And what you need to know is that John really, really likes the word like. In fact, he uses the word like seven times in the space of four verses. From verses 12 to 16, he uses the word like seven times. I think I think about it with me for a moment, okay? You know this is symbolic language because Jesus is not sitting right now at the right hand of the Father with a a two-edged sword coming right out of his mouth. Amazing as that would be, you know that that's not literal. So our scene opens with John hearing a trumpet-like voice behind him. And he turns. And get this. Get this. So he hears a trumpet-like voice behind him. He turns. And this is actually what, what the text says. He turns to see the voice. And when he does, in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, which are symbolic for the seven churches, he sees one like the Son of Man, which is a direct link, direct link to Daniel 7, 13 through 14. And this Son of Man has come to, church, to, to serve those seven churches' notice. He's come to weigh their good and their bad. So this tells us that John is seeing Jesus as judge. The vision of eyes like fire, feet like burnished bronze, and a sword protruding from his mouth suggests his role as judge. But Jesus is not just any kind of judge. He is a wise judge. And how do we know this? Well, because the wool-colored hair connotes the image of wisdom associated with age. And so John is not only concerned with conveying the image of Jesus as a wise judge, and he is definitely that, but he's not just concerned with justice. His long robe and the golden sash around Jesus' chest communicate his role and his, his stature, his position as pure high priest. And so when you take all this stuff together, when you take the figurative descriptions together, the unveiling of Easter Jesus is good news for some and bad news for others. You see, because what concerns Jesus is not revenge, it's righteousness. People from every tribe, nation, language, and socioeconomic status will, will find themselves experience either, experiencing either the righteousness of God or the righteousness from God. The former will end you. The latter will save you. And this is precisely why Revelation should encourage those of us on Christ's side, because what it does, it tells us that Jesus can end evil without ending us. That's good news. So what does his unveiling mean for us? I'm glad you asked. Two things. Two things. First, His unveiling gives us confidence in suffering. In verse 9, John says that he is our brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. You see, the things that beset John and the seven churches are the same things that beset us today. And what are those things? 
societal pressure to worship the world system and to yield to idolatry. You see, but we, what we do, and our problem, is that we, we exercise the terrible tendency to truncate suffering to a few things, to diseases, to financial problems, to relational discord, and if you're a millennial, to not having enough followers on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> but suffering is more than that. But Jesus' unveiling gives us confidence in suffering. Confidence. Think about that word for a second. Confidence. Con, meaning with, and fide, meaning faith. So we can approach our suffering with faith. Why? Because in Jesus' unveiling, faith has been swallowed up by sight. There will come a day when we see Jesus as he is and suffering will be no more. Rescue would have come fully and finally. So my message to you, Christian, is endure. Persevere like a good Calvinist. None of you caught that. It's okay. (laughs) There's a quote that I love from a movie entitled The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. Perhaps you've seen it. And the movie is about a group of retirees, British retirees, who decide to descend upon the thought-to-be-beautiful Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. All the literature, all the the website, I mean, everything looks gorgeous. The place looks like a literal paradise. But when they arrive, they find that the place is in a complete dump. And so what do they do? They they approach Sonny, the hotel manager, about false advertising and the unlivable conditions. And Sonny says something really, really profound. This is what he says. In India, we have a saying. Everything will be all right in the end. If it's not all right, then it's not yet the end. It's pretty powerful stuff. Sonny was preaching the gospel. Things will all be all right in the end. If they're not all right, it's not yet the end. Hear me. You are not your circumstances. And suffering doesn't define you. The Son of Man does, and He sees you right where you are. To quote Dennis Johnson, persistent endurance connects present suffering to future hope. I'll repeat it. Persistent endurance connects present suffering to future hope. I love that. That's good stuff. I wish I would have come up with it. The second and last thing Jesus' unveiling does is that it welcomes us out of hiding. See, you and I, we do our best hiding out in the open. And we do that by wearing masks. It's a stained glass masquerade. Listen, in Christ, you can lose the mask. In Christ, you are free from the pressures of pretending. You could lose it. You're free. Really, really free. You don't have to hide who you really are, imperfections and all, because Jesus loves you as you are, not as you should be. Let's pray. Almighty God and Father, Lord, we thank you for texts like Revelation 1. We thank you, Lord, that they confront us and yet comfort us. Lord, you remind us that this Jesus, Easter Jesus, is for us. He sees us right where we are. That we can embrace the suffering as identification with the resurrected Son of God. And that we don't have to hide any longer. That we could be who you've called us to be, imperfections and all, because you love us. We're no longer strangers cut off from covenant promises, but we are sons and daughters. That is good news. That is the gospel. And Lord, we glory in that. I ask you to take us deeper into the truths of the gospel daily. Remind us of what you've done for us on the cross and remind us that you were resurrected for our justification. We ask these things in your name, name, believing that you hear the cries and the prayers of the righteous. Amen.